Hey folks, welcome to another installment of The Mind of the Skeptical Leftist. I uh, just wanted to uh, do a quick intro for this episode. I really in enjoyed this chat with Andrew, uh, but some stuff has happened since the last episode that I need to uh, discuss. Um, first, I encountered, obviously, uh, that video about Keffels and Kiwi Farms. It got more attention than most of my videos do. Um, so it's doing okay. It's got a few, like over 150 views or something now. And it has more comments than others. And obviously, because of the troll nature of Kiwi Farms, uh, they came, those commenters came to comment because they're trolls. And <laughs> I just have to bring up this one commenter um, because it's a lot of fun. It's, it's probably my favorite thing that's ever happened. Um, first of all, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, literally the worst show I've watched in a very long time. Wow. Zero out of 10. Astounding. Impressively horrible. So wretched you would think a script and hoove team would be required. I don't know what a hoove team is. The fact that just the two of you are able to be this bad off the cuff is absolutely amazing. This is fucking phenomenal. This kind of comment is absolutely my favorite thing because they don't have anything productive to say. They can't actually argue against any of the points that I've made. They probably, you know, only watched half the video, but they just didn't like the tone of us or whatever. They're just, you know, they're just being critical, but without any actual substance. This kind of shit comes out all the time. Uh, trolls are garbage people who just, you know, they just have to say negative shit. My response to this, uh, this uh, quote or this uh, comment was that actually this comment speaks volumes about how good a show I produce. If someone comes on any other episode and says that it's bad, I might take them seriously. But on this episode, it's a clear endorsement because you're not coming here in good faith, but merely to undermine. Thank you for demonstrating that Felicia and I are on the right path and that, the, and that my show is good. So, <laughs> so I appreciate your fucking bullshit comment. I appreciate the engagement. You come and comment on my stuff. You hit that down vote because you think that's going to hurt me. And then I get more at attention on my video, which is counter to whatever bullshit narrative you wish was out going out there. So then <clears throat> we've got the re reply. There we go. <clears throat> so they say, ha, thank you for doubling down on your astounding trait of seeing up as down. It's amazing illogic on so many levels. No explanation as to why. Uh, kid, listen, word to God. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in God. So your word to God means nothing to me. I stumbled onto your channel, right, because of the Kiwi Farms and the Keffels hashtags. Uh, there's no persecution or capitalist conspiracy, I never said there was, uh, to shut down your show. No, you, as a troll, come to try and undermine uh, the message that I'm sending by making a comment that you hope will make people not watch the show. That's what trolls do. Don't inflate your own self-importance. Uh, <laughs> and one YouTube comment doesn't affect anything. My comment isn't for anyone on earth else on earth but you. A direct message to you. There's millions of ways to send a direct message to me that aren't public. I give email addresses. There's a contact form on my uh, website. You can contact me through any uh, social media. If you don't want a public comment to be public, that's fine. If you want to send something directly to me, that's how you do it. This is a public comment intentionally designed to undermine my video and to make people think that it's not worth watching, which is, which, but it has the opposite effect because now you've enticed people to think that, oh my God, they're saying something important or something controversial. <clears throat> It was that bad. No, it wasn't. Like, you actually have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Uh, you come off as a bright enough kid. I'm 45. You're an idiot. You're, like, assuming I'm a kid because... Actually, you're probably not even assuming I'm a kid. What comes out here is it's an attempt to demean me is what it is. But it doesn't work because I'm a grown-ass adult with self-confidence and it doesn't derive from the approval of trolls on the internet. Uh... You come off as a bright enough kid with decent enough intentions who just fell down the anarchy rabbit hole. Uh, no, I've been studying anarchy for probably six or seven years. Uh, I've been co studying communism for around the same amount of time. I, I fell into conservatism and right-wing bullshit and capitalism. And when I started reading and learning intentionally, that's when I learned about anarchy and communism. So he continues. 
I played around with communism and anarchy in my youth too. No, you didn't. You don't know what you're talking about, obviously. You said in the beginning you liked anarchy because it's constantly being reimagined or something to that effect. Uh, I said that it can adapt to the evidence. I said that it can uh, change uh, when it is shown to be incorrect. <laughs> That's why it's a useful uh, heuristic for viewing the world through. <laughs> so... Uh, Talk about non-intellectual uh, nonsense here, uh, and yeah, that's the allure. Yeah, that's not that's not the allure. That's it's fundamental. Like that's the one of the strengths of it. The anti-statism, the anti-hierarchy stuff. That's important. That's that's the core, right? But on top of that is an a, acceptance of evidence, an acceptance of understanding the world as it is, so that you can adapt to it and change it. <sighs> But that co-host of yours, good God, I'll be nice and just say the same doesn't always apply. Uh, actually, Felicia's brilliant. And I think that anybody uh, who, who's pathetic enough to be commenting negative shit on some small channel like mine uh, really isn't the person to be taking advice from. Uh, so anyway, I do wish you luck in life, kid. Uh, yeah, you're probably like a 13-year-old dipshit who thinks you're smarter than everybody else. Uh, because you live in Kiwi farms and everybody confirms your biases all the time. Uh, I suggest reading a book. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, it's, it's amusing as fuck to me that a guy like this thinks that his comment is somehow relevant. I, I, at first I didn't even read it cause I, I, so I just replied, blah, 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 fuck off, get the fuck out of here because I don't need the approval of uh, internet trolls. Like I, I do this show for those who want to watch it. I do this show for myself because I have a need to get this outlet, uh, this stuff off my chest in a lot of ways and to learn and, and to grow with the world and to learn more about how things are working. But yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, pirate, whatever the fuck name, uh, Pirate McCall. Thanks for your bullshit comment. I'm every bit of uh, attention that you bring to the channel is appreciated. Uh, so anyway, that's the fun part. Um, I also, I, I have to, I have to get somber for a moment. Um, um, a friend of mine recently passed away. Uh, she was on my old show, uh, the brainstorm podcast, and she was genuinely one of the, the best people I've ever met in my life. Uh, she helped me learn about feminism. She helped me learn about com like how to be a compassionate person and still uh, how to understand just being kind, but also standing up for what you believe. Um, I was friends with Angela for a number of years. We did. She was on my old show for a, a long time and uh, like four or five years uh, she was on that show with us. And I couldn't have asked for a better uh, co-host and, and friend. And uh, it's uh, it was devastating when I got the news that she had passed. And uh, yeah, I, my heart goes out to her family and, and her, her, her children and her husband and her, her relatives. Like uh, I'm still friends with uh, her cousin and, and uh, yeah. It's just, it's hard when people pass before they, uh, before their time. And, and legitimately it feels like, uh, sometimes the good are the ones who die young. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I can say about that. I, I don't mean to send you into the, uh, interview with Andrew on a negative note or on a somber note, but I, I had to say something. I was thinking about putting together like a, an in memoriam, uh, type of clip uh, set because she she was had one of the best radio voices you could hear. Uh, whenever she would say hello at the start, we would all ooh and ah at the the sultry tones of her uh, voice. And yeah, just an amazing person. One of my favorite people in the entire world. And uh, it's really it's really sad and tragic that she's gone. But uh, I guess in whatever uh, cheesy way I can. I dedicate like this episode to her and uh, um, my future in uh, in feminism and and uh, and trying to make the world a better place. Like she wasn't an anarchist, but she was genuine, genuinely one of the best per people I know. Uh, so with that, uh, I guess I'll do the the silly plugs. Uh, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. You can send me money at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. Uh, you can uh, give us a rating or a review on uh, Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice. I like Podchaser, but nobody seems to like it. Um, and if you want to contact me, my email is 
mind of a skeptical leftist at gmail.com. Uh, uh, Mr. Pirate McCall uh, or Miss Pirate McCall or, or non-binary individual uh, Pirate McCall. Please, if you have a direct message to me, send it that way or else you're going to be uh, dragged on <laughs> a video. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, what else is there? I guess that's it. Thank you very much to everybody who supports my show and supports this content and shares it around everywhere. I really appreciate it. On to the interview. <laughs> All right. Hi and welcome to uh, The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Almost uh, said the name of one of my other shows. <laughs> uh, this is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Andrew Sage, uh, also known as Andrewism, formerly uh, St. Andrew. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. And hopefully by next day, I'll have like three more pseudonyms. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's right. So I guess a good place to start is like uh, a little bit about who you are. Um, I mean, obviously you don't have your, your picture on the, on the video. Uh, you, you're a, a private person who's trying yeah, to. Yeah, I yeah, I try to be. Which is absolutely fair. Uh, but whatever you want to tell us about yourself. Uh, that would be great. Sure. So as Corey said, I'm Andrew and um, I have been really into politics since 2016, unfortunately the wrong side of it. <laughs> uh, but since then I've, I've, I've had quite the turnaround and especially in 2020 had a lot of um, political maturity and development and learning taking place as I just read and expanded my knowledge. So I, I, I believe that anarchism most closely approximates my my aims. Uh, I call my channel Andrewism because I believe that um, each and every person should try their best to, I want to say like customize their ideology <laughs> to to figure out for themselves to think for themselves about what ideas they uh, they want to see achieved in this world rather than just adopt somebody else's whole thinking and mindset. Cool yep. <laughs> yeah, that's a message I can endorse. I, I, uh, I know and like many people who claim to be Marxist Leninists, but I often wonder about naming my ideology after a person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And even, even though anarchism isn't named after any specific person, I still, you know, I, I see the importance in, so, you know, finding your own way within that. Yeah. And yeah, so, sure. Just for some more background, I'm um I've been doing YouTube since mid Ju mid 2020. I think it was either June or July 2020 is when I got started, and really been enjoying it ever since. Um, That's I am from Trinidad and Tobago, born, raised, and still living. And um, yeah, I'm just Very really cool. passionate about these sorts of projects. Oh, that's awesome! You you seem to have like your content is always like very like informative and, and entertaining. So uh, you must read a lot is kind of the impression I get. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's certainly, um, certainly some, so like my Goodreads yearly read and goal, read and challenge goal is 24 books. So roughly two books a month. Um, That's pretty good. However, <laughs> Last year, I surpassed that goal, which was amazing. This year, I am several books behind on that goal. Oh, okay. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see. I, um, I, will, I do, do try to read a lot, though, because I'm just trying to constantly expand on what I'm trying to get out of this whole world. No, nope, fair enough. I, I'm, I'm trying to push myself to read more now. But for probably the last two years, I haven't read a single book. So, <laughs> so two books a month seems like pretty impressive to me. <laughs> yeah, I would say that what definitely helps, and I've been trying to get back on the horse lately, but what, what really helps is um, having, like, I know nobody uses Microsoft Edge, but <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft yeah. Edge actually has a very, like, it has a PDF viewer, like most browsers do. But it also, right. within that PDF viewer, it actually has some very 
well-developed um, text-to-speech voices. And oh, so wow. I've been using those to like help me progress through books. So even though I, I don't necessarily pay for a bunch of audio books or whatever, I can still listen. And sometimes I'm able to follow along in the book. Sometimes I have other things to do. And, you know, just being able to listen to that while I'm like washing dishes, it really helps. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Amazon sucks, but I subscribe to Audible. So I have a, <laughs> an audio book subscription that I, I, uh, I listen to a lot of audio books lately. I, I kind of got away from theory though and w- started just listening to like fantasy novels for a while <laughs> just to get out of the politics. <laughs> That's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a little while since I've listened to, um, to any fiction or read any fiction. Um, a lot longer than I've been meaning to. Um, I think it's only a couple months ago that I wrapped up reading the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Nice. I think I was also reading some Octavia Butler and some, um, it's like Kilo Quinn, but Very I, cool. yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been doing a lot of nonfiction lately, but not even necessarily nonfiction in the realm of specifically anarchist literature uh, or specifically anarchist or even socialist theory. It's more so I'm just like looking for, for information and using that and, you know, stewing over it, digesting it and fitting it into my worldview in one way or another. Uh, very cool. Uh, so I guess, uh, you kind of said you were on the ops, the wrong side of politics in 2016. What what was it that brought you around to anarchism or anarchist type ideas? Right. So to clarify, um, it was really 2015, 2016. Um, I grew up in a religious context, and um, particularly like a full gospel Christianity slash evangelical Christianity kind of context. Um, because evangelicals have done a really good job of spreading evangelicalism <laughs> across the globe, right? So there, yep. there are churches all over the place, evangelical churches all over the place. Um, and so I grew up in that context as I was, you know, going through my spiritual questioning, my religious questioning, a whole journey, I had simultaneously gone through my political transformation away from, um, Christianity and away from, um, like, sort of that conservative thinking. It wasn't something I'd like consciously like thought much about, but it didn't take long for myself to like think myself out of it. You know, but <laughs> my first introduction right. to politics was um, because I was, I came from a homeschool background as well. And okay. so there's this guy on YouTube, his name is Hunter Avalon. And before he got into politics, before he started doing political content as well, he was doing um, <laughs> like homeschooling humor. Which is, it's, it's quite, quite niche. But anyway, um, I was quite young at the time and I thought, okay, well, this is, this is my kind of vibe. Um, and then he, around 2015, 2016 is when he made the shift towards, you know, with the election and stuff going on in the US. And so oh, he was okay. making content about that. And so that was my first introduction to politics. Ah. And then from there, the algorithm kind of put me in on to other people. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there's only so far I could go down that sort of right wing line because at the end of the day, I'm still black. Right. But, um, fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but eventually, um, I just happened to be on Tumblr and I got exposed to anarchist and some socialist ideas. I got a couple whiffs of, of bread tube, um, of like Sean and philosophy oh, tube yeah. and contrapoints, those sorts of people. And, um, even though I was moving away from Christianity, what kind of kept me for a little bit um, was this one particular person on Tumblr who went by like Kropotkin Christian. Um, okay. And so they were really what introduced me to anarchism in the first place and then simultaneously to uh, more progressive and more liberatory liberation theology sort of strains of uh, Christianity. And even though I didn't end up staying in Christianity, it was still very illuminating that that person sort of helped me, you know, get out to that. You know, they went away sure. that they were helping me with that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Like, you often, uh, left politics is often portrayed as anti-religious. But there is, like, an actual, like, uh, group within left politics that is, like, l- they follow, like, liberation uh, philosophies and, like, uh, or liberation theology, or uh, I believe it yeah. is. And, yeah. Yeah, like, there is a, a Christian left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is, there is, there is. 
unfortunately, the Christian right is a lot, has a lot more um, voice and a lot more yeah. political power. But <laughs> I think that's something the Christian left should really be focusing on. It's it's building instead of yeah. you know, sort of. I think right now they're a bit spread out. I think they should try and focus on you know sort of bringing their different movements together yeah. and really speaking up a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of build some communities and get your voices out there is kind of yeah. The, uh, try try and flip the narrative, you know, because unfortunately the narrative right now about Christianity is overwhelmingly conservative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you can did you explore like the uh, like the kind of Marxist Leninist type of ideas as well, or did you go yes yes right I, into I did. Um, I mean, for the entire, I would say for most of the period of time. I identified as an anarchist, um, but besides reading the Communist Manifesto and the Conquest of Bread, I did not have that much anarchist okay. theory under my belt. Um, 2019 is when I started reading, listening to you know those two, Communist Manifesto and Conquest of Bread. Um, but it was really early 2020 when you know with lockdown and everything, I had more time to read and stuff a bit more, and. I was, I got more active on Twitter and stuff. And so I discovered left Twitter. Woe is me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Nothing will make you less, less inclined to join the left than left Twitter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But um, my first introduction to left Twitter, because unfortunately, uh, a lot of the louder voices on left Twitter are Marxist Leninists. Yeah. Um, and so at least in, in the introductory sphere of left Twitter. Um, and so I had, I had seen a couple of different narratives um, about like North Korea and about China and about Vietnam and what these different places. And so I was, right. I was curious. Um, I did some reading. Um, I checked out the links people had sent me. Um, and yeah, I I was not convinced. <laughs> I just put it like that. Um, yeah, the that's the fair. justifications that they were providing for, you know, necessity of the state or for um, why the workers did not have um, you know, autonomy and and self determination right. within, and this sort of weird approach towards like taking uh the party and taking. The general population and like conflating the two as right. if having political power does not or having outsized political power does not mold your interests towards a specific end yeah um i just for all the it's talk of materialist <laughs> analysis and stuff I, I realized it was just a very deeply unserious sort of post hoc justification for something that people already wanted to believe they wanted right. to believe that there are still socialist states out there and they're still fighting the good fight and whatever. When in reality, unfortunately, while some projects certainly had more potential, more hope than others, they have not <laughs> succeeded, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I, well, of course, while external influence and external control and external meddling, whether it be through that sort of tug of war with the Cold War or whether it be through just direct US interference, I think that definitely played a role, uh, sure. a significant role in those failures. But another issue that brought me the wrong way was the lack of approach to these failures in a way that address anything other than U.S. involvement, that address anything other than mm -hmm. like sort of internal contradictions and stuff that would have contributed to those failures. Like, for example, uh, with the Black Panther Party, right? Very important, very revolutionary, very influential group, right? And inspiration to people all over the world. However, comma, while Quintel Pro played a large, significant, massive role in the um, dissolution of the um, Black Panther Party, there were already hints of um, division, such mm -hmm. as between the East Coast Panthers and the West Coast Panthers, or between, or within the internal hierarchy of the party, or between the rank and file and the greater party. Um, directors or members. Right. Um, and so I found there was a complete lack of analysis and as to, you know, where these projects had failed, how we can do differently. Because if you just take, you just say, oh, well, 
the US caused them to fail and you just dust off your hands and say that's that, you completely miss out <laughs> on all the literature that former members would have written, all the internal critiques that people in these different countries have written. And right, right. all of the different nuances and disagreements and such within these movements, within these countries, you miss out on all of that because you, you want to hold on to this one particular narrative because it's, I guess, more comfortable. Right. Yeah. And, and so, that gives you an opportunity to like learn and grow and like do things exactly, differently. Exactly. We're not going to recreate the 20th century. 20th century right. is dead and gone, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I ended, sure. up, um, I ended up reading critiques, I ended up reading um, different perspectives, I ended up reading um, anarchist critiques more specifically, um, even critiques from people who weren't necessarily anarchists, but leaned, and I guess those sorts of more libertarian directions. Um, I ended up also stumbling upon a video series by a guy on YouTube named Anarch or Daniel Barian, oh, and yeah. he has this excellent series on how the state is counter-revolutionary. Um, yep. <laughs> I highly recommend everybody gives that a watch. Um, and that, those sorts of things really solidified to me that this is not, you know, the move, you know, this is not what I'm, I'm not, this is, I can't go in that direction. And so, um, yeah. between the anarchist FAQ, between anarchy works, like to get the loose, between, um, anarchism and the black revolution by Lorenzo Kumbo Irvin, um, alongside other feminist texts and so on and so forth. I, I really, came to the realization that um, anarchism really is the path that I see, you know, means and ends wise. It is right. the means, I believe, or, I mean, there are different ways of looking at anarchism, in, but in this case, I would say it is the means to the ends that I believe would be liberation. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously I agree. <laughs> 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 I, I, I find often, like, it's very hard to communicate uh, why I think the state uh, has been counter-revolutionary to people. And if they don't want to watch like Anarch series on it, like then I don't know how really to convince them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> between means and ends, between the Anarchist FAQ, between, um, and of course, Daniel series, I think by now, if somebody was genuinely, well, I wouldn't say by now, because everybody's at a different stage in their journey, but I would say that if somebody really is genuinely, um, curious about anarchist critiques of the state not only do we have you know centuries worth of writing we also have contemporary projects taking place of people criticizing of offering these critiques yeah. um and so it, that's part of what took me off of marxism and leninism as well it was the way that um both in the literature and on social media the way that they engaged with anarchism um mm. lenin famously was not an anarchism understander. <laughs> yeah. for that um, that way. <laughs> and so I think a lot of Marxist Leninists just continue in that um, in that tradition of th these sorts of one hundred and one critiques that are greatly engaged with in anarchist literature. Um, the classic on authority maneuver that's oh geez <laughs> put up there, you know. And then on top of that, the um, the sort of critique of anarchism that's just like a right-wing critique of communism <laughs> right right yeah the on authority move is like i i hate to break it to like people who like angles but that's not a good piece of theory <laughs> like, it's, it's, i don't even think it was intended to be but it, <laughs> like yeah it really isn't and i mean no shade to angles because i mean he, he has written other stuff before that you know a lot better yeah um but yeah. Honestly, At the same time, <laughs> I, I just find it interesting that, that him and that text in particular held up, considering the examples that he uses, considering right. his class background. I would think that people would want to be a bit more critical of how he would approach a topic like that. But yeah. again, it's, it's sort of rationalizations after the fact of something that you really strongly believe in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like... Uh... Like you mentioned, the uh, the way that having political power it changes your uh, material interests. Like it seems like people who often discuss things and, and want to be viewed as historical materialists, uh, 
it seems like they're missing that aspect of it, like the actual way that it's worked in the past. Right. It's, I don't know. It's, it's just very hard to get it through to people. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. So in, uh, in the notes here that it says that you've got a book that you're writing. So I'm curious, what, what is your book about? Right. So, um, I mean, there's a second book, um, but that's like a poetry book and I won't get into okay. that right now. Um, the first the primary book that I'm working on is, I mean, I don't have a title for it yet. So the working title is, um, the maroon project. And it's essentially an exploration of, um, Caribbean history, um, oh, cool. Caribbean issues, present issues, what I would call the Caribbean pathology, um, consisting of, you know, all the intersecting structures of oppression that cause all these problems in our society. And finally, um, solutions for a truly revolutionary, truly liberated Caribbean future. Um, it's definitely, of course, written for a Caribbean audience, primarily, first and foremost. Um, but the ideas within it are largely can be applied to, you know, the world at large. Um, the critique of the Caribbean pathology from, you know, capitalism, the state, private property, um, patriarchy, all these different things are, of course, issues that are found around the world. Um, sure. But I wanted to fill a void in the Caribbean literature space because there has really been a lack of um, loud, uh, present left voices in mm. at least the Anglo-Caribbean sphere, um, you know, like Bahamas, Jamaica, Trinidad, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, Barbados, all these different places. Um, there, there has been a void because in the 20th century, there were very active trade unionist movements and Grenada had the New Jewel movement, which was, you know, dealt with by the U.S. Um, mm. And there was, of course, the Black Power move revolution in Trinidad in 1970. Um, however, there's less like shadows, whispers, ghosts, uh, tumbleweeds compared to what once was. And so I think right. this next generation needs a, 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 a vision um, to mobilize them because just like in the rest of the world, you know, this next generation is dealing with issues of housing and food and just general instability and crisis. Right. Um, the lack of sustainability and um, self-reliance within the Caribbean is also a concern um, because as colonies that were based on it and built for extraction um, as, you know, plantation economies, um, despite independence, due to the lack of reparations and due to the lack of any sort of remuneration for the losses and damages and such that were inflicted upon this region, um, we are still very reliant on the outside, on imports. Um, and so I think one of the primary aims should really be food autonomy and other forms of autonomy for the region um, and okay. for its people. And so I think this generation has a major role to play in bringing that and bringing that about because i think some of the old heads are um a bit stuck in those sorts of those sorts of more traditional ways um the education system is definitely plays a role in that um right. and sort of establishing a certain mindset within the people and so i i know that a lot of us are looking for something different and i just want to um offer something different i don't think that anarchism has really been presented um, clearly and concisely to this audience before. Um, right. Not that anarchist ideas haven't been present in the works of like C.L.R. James or um, certain other writers and thinkers, but a lot more um, can be done, um, especially written for a 21st century audience. And so that's what I'm hoping to achieve. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot gets written about like uh, the United States or... Uh, yeah, like uh, the big loud countries. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, exactly. But a lot doesn't. Yeah, a lot of other places get ignored. Like, um, so it's good that uh, it's like good. You don't, to you don't often something. hear people talking about like East Timor, <laughs> or, <Right. laughs> or like one of the Pacific Islands, one of the smaller Pacific nations, or the Anglo-Caribbean. I mean, even when we're talking about within the left, 
most yeah. discussions of the Caribbean are focused on Cuba, right? right. Occasionally yeah. Haiti, um, occasionally Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico has a lot. Puerto Ricans have a large presence in the U.S. Um, and I mean, there are some niche. MLs who would know about the new jewel movement in Grenada. But otherwise, you know, the whole range of cultures and histories <laughs> right south of like the US and a lot for <laughs> and the most part, result, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not really seen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's too bad. Like, uh, like you say, a lot of people focus on, uh, like, especially on the left, focus on Cuba because it's considered a success in many ways, right? Right. Which, uh, is fine i guess <laughs> uh, <As> but <laughs> i have um I've, I've had friends from cuba um i mean i knew one particular uh, woman who was a neighbor for a bit who came from cuba and she was working to send money back for her family and um i i just really want people to just engage these countries in like an honest way and to right. stop like putting on these rose tinted glasses because the embargo, of course, is, is a significant issue uh, yes. within the country, but the lifting of the embargo is not going to solve all of Cuba's issues overnight. There are a lot of other right. internal issues that existed prior to the embargo and will exist after the embargo that also needs to be resolved. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I visited Cuba in 2009, and uh, uh, my, I guess at the time it was my wife's, uh, now ex-wife's, uh, cousin's stepdad was from Cuba. So we talked a bit about that, but I was a right winger at the time. So I was very (laughs) (laughs) anti-communist. And so I, I had a very particular perspective when I was talking to him about it. And, and now looking back, I wonder if maybe I had been, you know, asking the wrong questions. And, but even then I was, I was kind of impressed with some of the stuff that was going on. Like, uh, uh, he said like that, when you graduate high school, then you get to choose to either join the military or uh, go into university. And I was like, well, obviously everybody's going to choose going into university, right? <laughs> 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 but I guess not. But uh, yeah. but it, it seems like if you look, compare that to the U.S. or Canada, uh, we have very similar kind of structure, except you also have to have all this debt piled on top of you when you come out of your schooling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, and, and I think that's, that's part of, I mean, just on an aside, I just want to say that Cuba's, you know, having to build its own self-reliance due to the issues um, it's dealing with because of the U S um, it's definitely an inspiration, right? And right. a lot of the projects they've taken on um, with re- re- regards to like urban gardening, that kind of thing, I think it's something that should be replicated right across the rest of the region. Um, but more to the point to what like you were saying about university and the fact that you go into a lot of a debt to to you know attend university in, in, in the US. Um, that's something that I've realized may play an influence at why people look at these other countries with yeah. rose tinted glasses, right? Because I mean, a lot of newbie leftists they look at like the social democratic countries, but then once you graduate past social democracy, um <laughs> people <laughs> tend to look at these other countries that I would consider also social democracies um and as someone who i mean we have like a mix of public and private health care but the public health care we do have it's it's free so when i was mm-hmm. doing this with my headache you know i got to the clinic for free but it was a long wait because you know it's free but uh <laughs> right got to the clinic i was able to get a ct scan for free i got my results for free i got everything for free got even got medication for free um, yeah, that's, so, that's a big difference. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're able to go to, I was able to get my tertiary education, um, not fully covered, though there is an option to have your tertiary education fully covered. But I got like, tuition fees are not that much. And also I got it 50% off. I, I only had to cover the other 50%. Right. And um, and even, and before that, it, everybody got it 100%. But due to some, you know, financial constraints ended up changing. Um, and of course, China is not like a, Transpego is not a, a social, it's not like a, a socialist right. country, right? It's, it's, um, it's just better than the it's, US. It's, it's like a standard, ways. it's a standard, like post colonial, yeah, social democratic esque sort of country. Just not currently a dystopia. <laughs> in a lot of ways, I think it can be, but not in that way. 
at least. <laughs> at least you don't have to um like a friend of mine broke his arm recently and he had to wait a while to get treated and get his x-ray and whatnot. But at least he didn't have to pay like a million dollars, right? Right, right. To get it dealt with. Yeah, in, in fact, Canada, they, there's actually so- a um I can't remember which of the islands, but there is a Caribbean country that is that has been putting a lot of focus on medical tourism, actually. Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of people who actually go to that country to get treated. Let me just check and see which, which one it is. Yeah, I know in, in, in Canada here we have free health care, but there's different segments of people who are trying to get it privatized because they don't feel like they should have to pay for everybody. And I have money, so why should I have to wait in line if I can pay for better service? So, uh, so they're trying to almost undermine the way that we have our healthcare system, right? Which which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> really isn't right. So I know Barbados has like a strong medical tourism sector. Oh, okay. As does Cuba and as does Jamaica, but primarily Barbados, I believe. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, again, you hear a lot about Cuba, but. I didn't realize uh, Barbados had a, had that as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Cuba does send a lot of its doctors around the region and around the world as well. So mm-hmm. I think that's why they're more well known because of that, um, you know, advocacy outward. Right. Uh, it's uh, beneficial, I guess, to multiple regions. So I guess kind of just to skip on to something else. Like uh, you said, you've been doing videos since 2020. Yep. So. Uh, I'm curious about your process. What, how do you pick your topics and, and how do you go through that? Um, just in the process of navigating life, of reading books, of, you know, going through social media, um, just different ideas for videos would come to me. Um, okay. I have like a very long list now, um, about six <laughs> years worth if I continue at this pace. Um, Wow. Of course, those are probably <laughs> narrowed down over time as some topics may get merged, some topics may get dropped, that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. um, I, yeah, I pretty much once I've I've got a topic in mind that I want to cover, um, I would go and it's really based on what I want to learn about and what I want to learn more about because that's how the channel kind of started. Um, pretty much learning what I learned and then sharing it with others, and so. Um, like I'm still, I'm reading through some degrowth stuff right now in preparation for a okay. degrowth video. Nice. Um, I recently released a video on the commons and when I was preparing for that, I read, you know, governing the commons by Eleanor Ostrom. Right. And, um, yeah, pretty much. Um, and then that has this negative, this positives, um, the negative being that for some videos, I have to read a whole book before I could even get started on writing it. A whole yeah. book or two before you get started writing it. And so sometimes la- laziness, you know, <laughs> it takes time. Off and yeah. Like, for example, the um, Commons video, I had the idea for that one since 2020. It's just, right. I saw Ellen Ostrom's book. I saw how she writes and I saw the length of the book and I was like, let me, um, <laughs> let me put this one off a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once I've I've done my research, you know, I usually as I'm reading through the book, I would highlight certain passages, I would make certain notes. Um, and then from there, um, so that's I outline what I want to talk about and what I want to talk about it before I start researching. Um okay. and other times I do the outline afterwards. Um I put down my notes and my quotes and my highlights, whatever the case may be, and then from there I just start writing and um from I think the the outlining stage takes about a day. Um, okay. The writing stage takes anywhere between <laughs> depends on the length of the video <laughs> um, and the amount of research that needs to be done. But it can take anywhere between a day to five days. Right. Um, and I'm like, this may, it may sound crazy for some who you know it may take longer to write, but when it comes to writing, I'm. As soon as I wake up to sunset, just going at it on the keyboard, you know. Uh, at this point, I don't really deal with too much um, writer's block. Oh, because, okay. Because the outline, and I kind of already know what I want to say. Um, and because now having two years of experience under my belt, mm. I kind of know how I'm going to say it. Um, so, yeah, between one day to five days, and then is the 
collecting stage. It was my least favorite stage. We have to collect <laughs> the artwork and stuff to to edit out the um the piece. And as I'm ah. collecting, I'm also editing the the writing itself to make it flow better, to have it fit with the artwork in some cases better. Um, and sometimes the collecting artwork stage can take a day, you know, a couple hours. Other times, it is headache inducing, grating. I use Google Images, right? And um, with Google Images, sometimes you're downloading WebP files, and so you have to convert them. Sometimes you get um, a really grainy thing, and so you're trying to get like a higher quality version of the image, and you're not finding it, and it's just it's a lot. Sometimes you have a certain <laughs> certain vision of a certain piece of art that you want. I, I stick to established artists and usually long dead artists. Um, okay. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you have a certain vision of what you want to see and you're just not seeing it and it can get frustrating. Um, and that's part of why I ended up drawing my profile picture in the first place. Because oh, originally yeah. my YouTube channel was just like a yellow circle. Right. And then I was like, I cannot fill every line of my script with a with a painting or a picture or whatever or a video. I need right. to have like some sort of depiction of myself. And so that's how my avatar got started. <laughs> um and so anyway, once I've done that collecting stage and stuff, I and done whatever edits I need to make, I record. Um and I usually do it in at the beginning I was doing it piece by piece. Um, but now I do it in one take and oh, okay. just wow. edit it out from there. <laughs> Once I've edited it, it's just to put the whole thing together in Premiere Pro. Hope and pray it doesn't crash like three times and, um, <laughs> you know, control yeah. S every two seconds, but yep. then it's, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, doing it all in one take. Do you have to then like, uh, like I find with doing the interview stuff, I do some editing not much. I probably listen to the same bit of audio or hour of audio three or four times, but for your kind of project, do you end up listening to it like a bunch of times? I, I do the editing in, in, in one sitting as well, usually. Oh, okay. So I do, I record in one take. Um, and I, I really try to avoid re-recording because I find that when I do re-record, they're very subtle, like atmospheric changes and background changes that just make <laughs> yeah. it sound like completely abrupt and, and weird. So that's why I ended up doing things in one take. And that's how I ended up, you know, trying not to re-record any yeah. sections. Um, like I would rather record the whole thing all over again than re-record one particular section. <laughs> yeah. And thankfully, I'm not, um, unlike some of my peers, <laughs> I keep my videos under 30 minutes. So it's a bit easier. <laughs> You know, I, I, if it was like a two hour long video, I definitely couldn't uh, right. do that that way. Yeah. I find like, <laughs> I often, like I try to do like a, a, a current events type of uh, intro sometimes to the final edited version of my, uh, of these interviews. And I find that if I don't have the right topic or, or the right script, I can just start rambling. And like 20 minutes later, I don't even know how I got to the end of where I'm talking about so, so right. i gotta i gotta be pretty careful about what i'm doing saying yeah i mean i'm i'm getting a bit better at speaking without a script um okay. because i've been doing the it could happen here podcast and right um and i've done a couple interviews and right now actually um i i've started for my patreons um sub subscribers doing like little live streams once a month and so I'm just kind of working on that aspect of it because I think I've gotten my narration mostly down, um, the way that I approach, you know, recording the videos. But, right. you know, there's more to speak in than just reading from a script. And even right. within that reading from a script, I'm trying to be, you know, trying to get better at it, trying to get more animated and, um, you know, work at my pace and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, because it's got to be, like, clear for people to hear. And also, but at a certain pace so they don't get bored. <laughs> like, it's not, uh, it's not as easy as, uh, people might imagine. I, I, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and there's the added component of my accent, right? Because I mean, in typical day to day conversation, I've seen some people joke about how slow quote unquote, I speak in my videos. Right. Um, if I were to speak at my typical conversational pace in a video, I don't, 
think I would be as well understood. Mm, um, yeah. And also as somebody who typically watches YouTube videos, um, at least slightly sped up, um, I don't think it's <laughs> that, that big of a deal, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. I, I've been told quite often that I have a very strong Canadian accent. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if people actually understand me or not, but <laughs> I've been doing this for too long to change now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's also the benefits in, in whether it be an American accent, a British accent, a Canadian accent, um, because those accents are very much present in media. I think people yeah, are more true. accustomed to, you know, listening to them and understanding them. Whereas when's the last time you heard a Trinidadian, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's not particularly common. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, I guess we're, uh, we're going to, we were, gonna, I guess you mentioned your Patreon. Um, you've actually, I guess before we get into the Patreon, like your channel has kind of grown pretty fast. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's, uh, I'm, uh, but deservedly so. Your videos are very good. Uh, so I'm, I'm <laughs> it's good that your channel grew at the rate that it did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so then your Patreon, like, uh, uh, one of the things that I like about Patreon is that uh, it often gives people access to like a discord community and which you also have, uh, associated with yours. So, uh, I wonder like what kind of things go uh, on in the discord community for your Patreon? Um, I mean, the discord community is not Patreon exclusive. Okay. That, um, that's good. <laughs> but I, I, um, <laughs> I'm not really involved in, in my, in my discord. Um, oh, no. I would, it was, repeatedly requested of me that I make a discord for my channel. Um, but first and foremost, I'm not that active on discord. Um, secondly, I'm not really interested in, in keeping up with like running a discord. And thirdly, I, I'm really, really wary of developing like parasociality at all. Fair. So yeah. I, um, I'm not that much involved in my discord. I, it, it basically runs itself. For the most part, but I see a lot of, you know, great discussions and stuff being had questions being asked and answered. And when I release my videos, of course I share them in there and I get some feedback and stuff from time to time. And so, yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. I, I find like discord, uh, if you're not in the right communities, like then, then it can be kind of like a, almost as alienating as every other social media. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I use it for our local uh, leftist, uh, slash anarchist group we we that's where we kind of hang out like all eight of us <laughs> and, chat, and chat but uh i find that it's good for that but yeah once you get over like a hundred people in there i don't know how you'd even keep track anyway yeah 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 it gets a little bit hectic and of course once you get over that count there is the inevitable um drama <laughs> right there's always right. some some sort of silver drama yeah, for sure. Well, we're at about 45 minutes. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to talk about? Um, not much in particular. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So I guess all that's left is where can people find you and your content if they don't already know? <laughs> right. So you can find me on youtube.com slash andrewism on Twitter, unfortunately, dot com <laughs> slash um, underscore St. Drew and on patreon.com slash St. Drew. Right on. Well, I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. It was great to have you. All right, folks, that's everything. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical, skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics. Uh, you can check out the videos that I do with my friend Damien Maria at Hope 
and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. You can also find the links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. Uh, you can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for watching or listening, and try to get involved with something in your area, and let's all work to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm.